Uh, it is a, a real pleasure to be able to be here with you today, although if I had a suggestion for next year's Iowa Port Congress, I might suggest somewhere a little further south, maybe uh, Cancun or uh, Aruba, somewhere like that, but um, it, it was also very cold when I left Indiana yesterday too, so uh, we share that in common. So um, I'm going to talk to you this today, don't really have a single unifying theme, but really rather I thought I'd just talk on a number of, of topics that I see sort of facing the industry and share with you some of my reactions. Um, hopefully you'll consider them insights and, and thoughts about, about these issues facing the, the industry. So here's a bit of an agenda for, for this morning. Um, first gonna just start by setting the stage, like what are the, what, you know, what are the issues that have been going on? I am an economist, so I'm gonna, you know, I can't get, get away with not showing you some slides of, you know, prices and quantities and that kind of stuff, but I wanna set the stage a little bit by asking what's happened over the last couple of years and how is that affecting the conversations that we're having right now about the future of the pork industry? So the other bullets there, the other topics, I'm gonna to spend some time talking a bit about um, concentration issues, capacity, resiliency. Of course, that's something that's, you know, um, uh, you know just came out of the White House earlier this, this uh, month. Uh, sustainability, ESG issues, how that relates to innovation. Might uh, talk a little bit about some of the emergence of innovation outside the industry, like uh, the, the new plant-based meat alternatives that could be affecting the pork industry. Uh, Depending on how time goes, may talk a little bit about some of the inflationary pressures, why I think that's happening, and then finally uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the politics around meat consumption. And I got at least one slide on Prop 12. Couldn't get away with not saying something about that today. So where are we at, and what's been happening? So these are, these are data just showing um, weekly hog slaughter numbers relative to the 2019 average. And there's a lot of movement up and down there, but of course you see the big drop off that happened about a year ago in uh, May and June of 2020 when we had the shutdown in the pork packing plants. And, um, but I, you know, one of the things I want you to notice from this graph though is actually for a lot of this time period, for the last couple of years, we're actually uh, producing more pork than we were in 2019, despite some of those shutdowns. The other thing you might notice is it's not uncommon to have big dips like that. Where are those other dips happening? Uh, they're holidays, so Christmas, um, uh, 4th of July. Uh, but what made this period so uh, concerning was it was an unexpected dip. So we typically know when a holiday is gonna come up and we anticipate and plan around the reductions in pork consumption, uh, production that are gonna happen then. But despite, despite the fact that that event was now almost two years ago, a year and a half or two years ago is, you know, that that time period is still having a major effect on current discussions around uh, the pork industry and the meat industry more broadly. Prices, what's been happening with prices? So these are values, they're uh, farm, wholesale, and retail pork values expressed relative to, uh, the, to January 2020. A lot of volatility, a lot of movement there. Actually, you know, you know, back this summer was a really good time at the farm level in terms of pork prices. Come down here a bit recently. Uh, if I was able to update these prices, actually there's been some, some more positive movement in the last few days and weeks. Uh, but I think the dynamics here, again, I think are, are interesting in the sense that um, a lot of the discussion is focused on that one period right there and, and what happened when we had this divergence between uh, farm level hog prices and wholesale meat prices. You know, as, from an economic perspective, that, that gap made sense to me. It wasn't fun, but it made sense because if you have a shutdown in the packing sector, uh, what does that do? It means there's, not, there's, there's too many hogs out there relative to the ability to process them so the value of any individual hog falls. So, you know, hog prices have to be, you know, depressed a bit. At the same time, we're putting less meat on the market, less meat to go around. Consumers are still bidding against each other for the whatever, you know, amount of meat is available. That's gonna pull up those wholesale prices. So for, from an economic standpoint, that, that, that widening makes some sense, even though it wasn't pleasant at all. The other interesting dynamic here is despite a lot of the national attention on uh, retail prices, what we as consumers pay, you know, a lot of the movement has been in the farm and wholesale prices. In fact, you know, those two actually move together quite, quite closely. Um, if, you know, we can look at quantities and prices, but we can combine those 
to make an inference about supply and demand conditions. So this is a, 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 a demand index and a supply index, and this is a longer period of time, going back to the uh, early 2000s um, expressed relative to that. So the top blue line is demand, wholesale demand for pork, uh, U.S. pork. You can see that you know the, the trend there is positive and increasing. In other words, uh, U.S. pork producers have done a fantastic job expanding demand for pork products. Uh, a lot of that's because of strong export demand, but also because of, of uh, demand here in the U.S. You can see the last you know, year or two, actually despite a lot of the pandemic, a, a boost in, um, in demand there. The red dash line is a supply index. It's basically an mar estimate of marginal cost of production. And uh, you can see that's come down quite considerably. You know, a lot of that's because of the really strong improvements in productivity and efficiency that the industry has seen. But what I want you to note is at the very tail end of that is this really big you know, increase in those marginal costs. So what's going on there? Uh, well, one thing is feeds more expensive. So this is a change in corn and soybean prices uh, expressed relative to the start of January 2020. So uh, if you're a corn or bean farmer, it's good news. But you know, you got those, if you're the, the hog producer, that's an extra cost to you. And we're seeing that reflected in prices. Uh, you know, they talked about the demand a little bit, and this is just uh, data on the, the share of U.S. pork production that is exported. Very positive trend, and, and so we're, you know, last couple of years and the projections for the next year ahead is about a quarter of all U.S. pork production is, is exported. Where is it going? I mean, China has been in the news a lot. China, this is just the share of pork going to different countries, the little dashed line there is uh, China. And indeed, you know, in 2020, a lot of pork went to China, but you can see here more recently, um, it's countries like Mexico and, and other locations that have picked up a lot of that pork consumption. So, um, you know, that's a little bit of a, a stage setting. And I think some of that, you know, price and quantity fluctuation that we see has led to these conversations we're having around concentration. And, and which relate to capacity and resiliency. So I want to share with you a few of my thoughts there. Uh, you know, back last summer, um, we were already starting to see a lot of discussion here, mainly in the form of lawsuits that were being leveled against the industry. A lot of this was focused particularly on the beef sector, but some of it in the pork sector too, um, where various groups were, were suing packers uh, or even some farm groups uh, suing packers related to uh, pricing issues. Uh, more recently, as I mentioned though, the White House came out with this announcement uh, earlier this month, planning to spend about a billion dollars um, on these issues. There's a bit of a breakdown for you in terms of what they say they're, they're gonna build, you know, spend that on, but about 600 million or so of that is targeted towards extra capacity, either in the form of grants or uh, subsidizing loans, lending towards some of those. And then there's you know, a variety of different spending in, in di some different areas there. So, First, you know, let's talk about, you know, what's maybe driving this and maybe what the, you know, what I do agree with in some of that announcement, which is that the industry is fairly concentrated. So these dots here, the, the red dots are the 15 largest pork packing plants. In fact, if we, you know, from sitting here in Des Moines, if we drew a, you know, couple hundred mile radius around us, we'd have, you know, probably half the pork production capacity in the U.S. E uh, pretty easily. Um, the blue dots there are beef, the 10 largest beef uh, packing plants. So combined, those, those dots there are producing about 60% of all pork and, and beef in the country. So, you know, it, it is in some senses a, a, you know, relatively concentrated industry. And I think the thought is, well, maybe if we dump a bunch of money out there, we'll just we'll add a bunch more dots across the country. And, and that will be a system that's more resilient and would be more beneficial perhaps to producers. From my view, the, the, the uh, conversation is much more nuanced than that, more complicated than that. So maybe one way to think about it is just, uh, what is the cost of adding more capacity? So um, I don't know exactly what the cost construction costs are at the moment, but if I just look at news stories of the costs uh, of production, the, the construction costs associated with a couple of the more recent large-ish large packing plants that have put in, you know, a rough guess might be, you know, $25,000 per head of daily capacity. Some of you in the room might, might have a better number than that. 
But let's just take that as a given. And the question might be is, well, let's suppose that almost half of the dollars the administration said it wants to put into building new capacity was spent, spent on pork. So let's say $200 million gets dumped into pork. What, what would that do at that cost? Well, it'd add about 8,000 head per day capacity, which is not nothing, but it's, you know, represents about 1.7% of all, you know, U.S. pork production. It's about the, it, that, you know, if all that was in one plant, it wouldn't even show up on that map I showed you before uh, because it's not large enough to be in there. So, you know, if, if this amount of money is really about adding capacity, it's not going to do a lot. Again, it's not nothing, but it's, um, it's certainly not a huge dent in the capacity issue. I should have mentioned, too, uh, the MPPC just released a, a report the other day with um, uh, some of my uh, friends and colleagues, Dermot Hayes and a uh, very good one about you know, some of these dynamics. And as they pointed out, if you actually look at pork, uh, per, uh, pork packing, concentration actually fallen a bit over the last few years as some new uh, packers have brought, brought facilities online. Um, the other way to think about this, though, is what does it really mean to be more resilient? And I think that's, that's more challenging. Um, the way I think about it is uh, what, what you really needed in that you know, era where we had the, the real challenges of, of the packing plant shut down because of COVID illnesses is you just needed extra capacity sitting around. Um, or another way to think about it is you needed redundancy in the system, which is another way people often think about resiliency. The problem with that is it's super expensive. Imagine if you went to a lender and said, I want you to give me $100 million to, to build a medium-ish medium -ish sized packing plant, but I'm only gonna run it half full because I want that extra capacity just in case something happens. I think that lender would look at you like you're crazy, right? That's not good, that's, not good, that's a proposition that's not gonna make good economic sense. Um, but that being said, I think that's the way to think about it. And maybe one way to think about it is capacity is more than just bricks and mortar, it's people. What does it take to get people there? And I think one of the things we saw the industry, probably many of you in this room have to deal with was, you know, how can you hold hogs on farms longer? What's the flexibility you have there? That's another way of adding flex in the system there. Uh, backups is another way to think about what it means to be more resilient. So many of you probably saw the news several months ago now when um, one of the big packers was shut down because there was a cyber attack, right? They actually got up and running pretty quick right after that. Why? Because they had a backup of their systems. So that's, that's another way to think about what it, what it means to be resilient. As we think about these issues of adding capacity, whether it's being used or not used, I think there is sort of a fundamental fact about you know, beef and pork and chicken processing that you can't really get around, and that's this issue uh, economies of scale. Basically, the larger you are, the lower your cost of production. So this is from an academic paper a few years ago comparing the relative costs of you know, large to small size plants. So the, the biggest one there is uh, 4 million head per year, and, the, and all the other costs of the other sizes are expressed relative to that. So if you're a smallish plant, like you know, over here, you know, your costs are 80% to 100% more, more than that big plant. And um, so why do I mention that? If, you're, if you spend that $200 million, let's say, on smallish plants, chances are they're going to be more, co their costs of production are, are going to be more expensive. And I think this graph goes a long way towards explaining why we have the level of concentration we do in the industry. It's not because of some, in my view, some kind of malfeasance um, or corporate conspiracy. It's that you need to be this big to be cost competitive. But there's only so much room for people that are this big. And the economics of packing are that you can't have a big packing plant, let it sit there empty. You need to run it close to full capacity to achieve these kinds of costs of production. So I think it's rather this, this economies of scale you're seeing coupled uh, with the size of the industry that explains why we have you know, relatively small number of, of large, large-ish plants. Uh, my colleague, Maylin and Ma and I, we've done some research just doing some specul you know, mathematical speculation, you might call it. Like, what if we took the industry we have now and imagined uh, you know, a number of hogs similar to what we have now, but instead many you know, smaller packers? What would that world look like? And you know, our estimates suggest you have lower hog prices and higher retail pork prices. Why? Because it's more costly. Those that you know economies of scale that I mentioned before, it might be 
a little more resilient to you know, just random shocks of shutdown, something like COVID. So in our simulations, we have a bunch of plants and one of them just randomly gets shut down for some reason. Uh, so every plant has some probability of shutting down. And what we find is there's a, a you know, if you had a world in which there were many you know, small plants, there's a, a somewhat smaller chance of some big reduction in output. But it's not enormous. So you're picking up a little, perhaps a little bit of extra resiliency there uh, in this world. So uh, maybe to kind of tie all this together, I think you know, there are opportunities, and I, I see it in my state of Indiana for sure, of people putting in extra packing capacity. So I think there's some room there. Um, and what are the opportunities? I think there does seem to be some growing demand for some more direct to consumer type marketing. I think that's an opportunity there. Uh, you know, I don't expect it to you know, be a large share of the industry, but I think there are some opportunities there. But I think the really important thing is, and that's the, the advice I've given to the folks in my state when they've come to us to talk about it, is you have to recognize that economies of scale. You're not going to compete on costs. So how are you going to compete? You need a plan for how you're going to compete, and that could be on quality differentiation. Maybe you've got a certain breed, you've got quality characteristics of the meat. Maybe you're going to compete on service, either service to the consumer or service to the farmer. Um, but you have to have a way of, of uh, competing that's not necessarily, I have lower costs than you do. And I think there's opportunities there. The other thing I think that's really important for a lot of smaller processors is uh, byproducts. So I've seen a lot of these uh, you know, budget analyses. For some reason, they don't come to us in the you know, ag econ department. They go to our meat science colleagues to create their budget you know, for their, their, uh, their new processing facility. And they always just assume that you get the market price for your product. And everybody can probably sell the loins and the bellies at the market price. But what are you going to do with the ears and the snouts and the hearts and the kidneys and the, you know, the hooves? Uh, chances are, if you're a small processor, you're going to have to pay somebody to take those away. You're not going to get the market price for them. It's another reason there's some economies of scale there, even in the marketing. Because if you have the ability to access markets, a lot of them international that want those products, now you have a, a not only is it not a cost to you, but it's a benefit to you. So you know, dealing with that issue of the so-called lesser preferred products, I think, is a major challenge for a lot of smaller producers. A lot of discussion on automation, um, and I think that's something that there are investments being made currently at the moment, but I think um, uh, you know, thinking about ways we can reduce our reliance on labor is going to continue to be an issue that I think is really important. Again, it gets back to the point I mentioned before that um, capacity is more than just about buildings. It's the ability to use those buildings uh, that involves the people that are involved there too. Um, you know, I think when we think about ways of spreading risk, you know, we do store, um, and I think that's one of the, it wasn't a number that I used to pay very much attention to, but you know, in all this world now of like, is there a shortage? Well, now a number you go look up is, well, how much is in storage? That is a way we, we smooth potential disruptions over time, and it's a way we continue to have to do that. One last point I'll make on this is that one concern I have, and I gave some testimony uh, to the U.S. House a few months ago on this is, you know, if you just dump a bunch of money to build new packing plants, that is, that's not going to make those packing plants profitable. And one concern I might have is we're going to wait. We might wake up five years from now and have a bunch of packing plants going out of business because we have too much capacity relative to the animal inventory. So there's, you know, so it's not profitable for that much capacity to exist. You know, in my view. If you want to you know, spend federal money on this thing, what you have to do is change the incentives in the system. You know, what, what's going to change to make more capacity profitable? And ways to think about that, I don't have the answers, but I think the way you think about it is how do we lower the barriers to entry? Uh, make it more profitable for more people to be able to compete? I don't know the answer to that, but there are you know, probably some regulatory barriers. Uh, what are the things that are keeping more people from being able to get uh, into business? So that's the way I think, you know, really is the way I would want to think about that is uh, if the White House were to call me and they didn't, uh, that's the way I would have encouraged them to think about that is what are the things you can do to invest, you know, affect the long term cost structure of the industry so that it is more profitable for more packers to exist in the long run, uh, not just here, you know, today. So shift gears on you for a minute um, and talk a little bit about, I think, some of the emergence of ESG environment, social governments, governance issues, uh, sustainability, and how I you know, view that relating to innovation. A lot of pressure right now, not just in the pork sector, but really across all of agriculture to 
think more about sustainability. It's really hitting, I think, retail and processing sectors pretty heavily. And as a result, it's gonna come back to the farm. I think when people think about this issue, I do a lot of consumer research, they think about, you know, what are consumers willing to pay for these things? That's not, you know, in my view, what's causing the pressure right now. What's causing the pressure are investors. And I know you can't see all the details there. And by the way, if you want any of these slides, just email me and I'll, I'll share them with you. Um, but, you know, there's about a trillion dollars of capital investment that flows into U.S. agriculture. Where does that money come from? A big chunk of that money comes from institutional investors. So think like Texas State Teachers Retirement Fund, New York, you know, pension funds, whatever. It's those groups and they're increasingly asking, well, if we're gonna put your, our money into your company, hold shares of your company or anything else, you're gonna have to adopt ES, various ESG criteria. That's where a lot of the pressure is coming from. And so you have, you know, and I think the challenge for a lot of say, let's, let's say food retailers or food processors is their ability to say change climate emissions within their four walls is pretty small. So to really make big changes, they have to reach back into the supply chain and, and get some credit there. I think all this is going on at a time when we're having, you know, we're in the middle, I think, of something of a, a digital revolution in agriculture. We have more sensors, we're collecting more data. We have, you know, a lot of vertical integration too. So that ability to collect data and move it throughout the supply chain is increasing the ability to track and quantify uh, various, you know, ESG metrics. One thing I will talk about though, is maybe a, a, as an aside before getting back to how we think about it productively is I think when we think about sustainability, I think it is a challenging subject. And I think from in talking about it to consumers is often a, a, a moving target. Um, and so maybe to, to talk about that, like I think one of the challenges here is it's a really complex issue and consumers don't always do well with complex. And so it creates uh, something of a treadmill, I think. So to give you a bit of an example of that, uh, 15 years, this is the cover of Time Magazine back when Time actually printed a magazine. I don't know if they still do anymore, but um, this was a cover uh, about 15 years ago. And you can see the, the sticker there said, forget organic, eat local. And I think that's just sort of symptomatic of a broader kind of cyclical trend of fads and fashions that sort of relate to sustainability issues. So it was organic that was really fashionable, then it was local, then, the, then it became sustainable, and then re now the word seems to be regenerative. I don't know what's gonna be next. There's probably another one. I'm not cool enough yet to know exactly what that is. Um, of course, we see that sort of thing in diets all the time too, right? It was low fat and then low carb, high protein. Now it seems to be plant-based. Clean labels is another one that's on there. And these things sort of rise and, and fall over time. Uh, why, why do we see these kind of cyclical patterns? I think there's a number of drivers. So what causes sort of the up cycle? What causes some, one of these movements to, to, to gain in popularity? I think one is that, that consumers and investors do have underlying concerns for things like environmental outcomes, health, animal welfare. They do care about these things. Now they're not always willing to pay enough to cover the cost for them, but they do care about them. So that provides a platform for people to appeal to those underlying preferences that consumers have. In addition to that, I think there's always a kind of a yearning for right or wrong. Consumers, you know, want some authenticity out of their food. They want to feel, you know, some, you know, trust in the food system. And that often gets tied up in sort of a bit of what I would think about as a kind of a romanticism around small and, you know, quote unquote natural, whatever that might mean. So I think that kind of underlying sentiment of consumers sets the stage then for, for different kinds of appeals to those underlying preferences. The other thing that, that you know, matters too is, you know, as we've become wealthier as a country, um, food has become you know, a relatively small share of our income. So we can, you know, we can show off by showing that I can afford more expensive food, right? So I can have the little horse on my shirt that shows I'm special. I can spend a little more on a piece of cloth that's otherwise perfectly you know, identical to yours. The other thing I think that, you know, in, in the complexity of things related to sustainability and, and ESG is that, um, that consumers don't like all that complexity. It's easier for them to think about silver bullets. If I buy the local, that solves all the problems. It's better for the environment, it's tastier, it's healthier, it's all those things. 
Um, so I think you know when an issue becomes new, it's easier for people to attach all those hopes and dreams to that as solving multiple uh, problems. And then often there's some you know core group of people that really believe in the idea and sort of pushes it into the mainstream. So then what causes it to sort of start to wane? And I should say it doesn't mean it always drops. Organic, of course, is still here. Market shares growing. So it's not as if it uh, you know went away. It's just maybe perhaps not quite as fashionable as it as it once was. Well, one reason is, is as a as a you know a claim a movement uh, gains steam, there becomes a need for standardization, right? If we're going to sell something that has a label on it that says you know regenerative, which there's not one right now. That's the problem right now is nobody knows exactly what it means. That's and so because you don't know what it means, it's easier for you to attach all your hopes and dreams to it because I can imp impose my own thoughts on what it should mean. But if you're a Walmart and you want to put that label on your shelf, all of a sudden you've got to decide what does it mean. Or the USDA, in the case of organic, says, here are the standards, here's what it means. And you actually need those standards for that movement to grow uh, so that it can gain some credibility over time. And of course, because you're adding standards, that's going to alienate some of the true believers. So again, let's take organic. And one recent example is it was a fight over whether hydroponic agriculture can be classified as organic. And there was a fight there. I think the hydroponics, uh, you know, if I'm not mistaken, won out. But some of the other folks said, well, that's antithetical to our vision of what organic means. So now organic is not worth anything to me anymore. Um, so that, that's one of the challenges. Of course, science evolves too. You know, we're, we study things. We don't really know the effect of, you know, organic or local or whatever. But as you study local, what you start to find out is actually the transportation is a very small share of the overall environmental impact. So uh, maybe that, you know, maybe it's not necessarily the best for the environment. You would, you did, we didn't know that before. It took research and evidence to show it. And then, of course, you know, something gains kind of in popularity. Um, you know, big companies get into it, they help bring down the cost that does, you know, spread the appeal of it, but then it, you know, makes it look a little corporatized. Um, and, you know, a lot of these movements, that sort of trustworthiness appeal to, to natural and small, that's antithetical to those ideals. So almost in some ways, the fact that it gets big and mainstream makes it less appealing. And then lastly, you know, if everybody can have a shirt with the horse on the side, it's not cool anymore. It's only cool when you're the only one that can do it, and you're, you know, you're friends. So uh, mainstreaming removes some of that prestige. So that's not going to go away. I think that these are, you know, these sort of cycles, ebbs and flows of kind of fashionable f food aren't going to go there, go away. But you know, what can we do to think about it, maybe in a in a productive way? So one is, I think we can try to be more science based, so that um, you know, we can be. Um, uh, you know, consumers are not necessarily attaching a bunch of false hopes and dreams to it. And also there's some evidence behind it. So I think the metrics of what it means to say be sustainable are really important and who gets to decide those. I'm going to you know, make the case even more in just a moment that I think productivity should be a key measure of sustainability. So that's the one I would advocate for. And how do we improve productivity? Innovation, in my view, is the, you know, one of the best ways to do that. So I think about innovation as kind of having your cake and eat it too. You get to eat your pork that you enjoy, your bacon, your, uh, you know, your, your pork tenderloin sandwich, but have it while it's having a lower environmental impact. Like that's having your cake and eat it too. How do we do that? Well, we have to innovate and we have to find new ways to do things. And again, we're, we're seeing ways that are emerging that can maybe help us do that a little, a little more in the future as we coordinate those data across those. I think one interesting dynamic there will be is, you know, there will be opportunities, I think, for entrepreneurs and, you know, current people in the industry um, where there's going to be real advantages to who has the information and who's tracking the supply chain, um, you know, metrics. I think there'll be some real opportunities and interesting there. And, you know, the hope is maybe with some quantification, standardization that might might help break some of this treadmill. One way I think about it is if you have a nutrition facts panel on food, you got the number of calories, you got the amount of protein, um, can, any consumer can look at it and sort of know, and they can then decide what's important to me. Is it the nutrition, is it the protein, is it the, the amount of carbs? Now, obviously the nutrition facts panel didn't cause fad diets to go away, but at least there is that objective information that can be used by consumers and, and producers. And so as we think about this sort of sustainability metric, I think that's going to be, for me, an important way to think about it.
I mentioned productivity, I think, as being really important uh, facet of sustainability. So how do I think about that? Um, first, let me characterize it in a way that we often talk about it, which is sort of we need to feed the world. So th these are small graphs, but the, the top blue line is the amount of pork produced in the U.S. over time. The line I've created below it is a counterfactual prediction. It asks the question, how much pork would we have produced if we would have never improved yield, the amount of pork produced per pig? And then the difference between those two lines is this black line below. So that's essentially the extra amount of pork we get because we've improved productivity. We figured out how to get more pork from each, each pig. So, you know, these days we're producing about, I think that's a million, 400 million more pounds of per pork per month because of improved productivity. And often the story I think in agriculture we tell ourselves is that's, uh, that's a great thing because uh, we've got a growing world population and we need to feed that world population. And I think that's true, but I think the sustainability story is we can turn this story sort of on its head. That these graphs look almost the same, but it's a slightly different calculation. The uh, orange line now is the actual number of hogs we've, we uh, have had in the United States over this time period. The blue line above it is the number of hogs we would have needed to produce the amount of pork we actually consumed in any one of those years if we wouldn't have increased productivity. And then this black line is the difference between those. I call this the number of pigs we saved. So uh, about two million. About two million, we would have needed an extra two million pigs per month um, had we not improved productivity and, and still wanted to enjoy the amount of pork consumption that we had to, today. And that's, to me, a real powerful story about sustainability. We could get, all, you know, we can enjoy this amount of pork we have, but many fewer animals, eating less feed, drinking less water, having lower impacts on climate emissions, all those things because we found ways to improve productivity. Um, so where is that innovation coming from? Um, what, what are the future innovations? I don't have all the answers here. Actually, actually, it's fun to walk around on the exhibition floor down there to see some of the interesting stuff. I saw some companies selling some AI, not, not the uh, um, uh, artificial insemination, but rather artificial intelligence, um, things to you know, monitor the pigs when they're in the thing, you know, detect if they have disease before you can even see it in your eye. This sort of machine learning stuff is really interesting. I was in a conference two weeks ago. There were some Silicon Valley guys that were building robots to pick uh, 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 strawberries. And they were talking about machine learning and robotics. And they're like, the machine, like, the machine learning stuff is solved. I was like, whoa, I thought like, we we're still trying to invest a bunch of research into this sort of thing. So the science is really interesting there. Um, gene editing, um, you know, vaccines, the ASF, I know there's a session right before this on that. Uh, topic, you know, there's some vaccines that are, you know, in the process there, but I think a lot of us in this room probably have been vaccinated against uh, the coronavirus with an entirely new technology that didn't exist a few years ago. When can we start deploying some of those technologies uh, in the pork industry? I think that's an exciting thought. Uh, we talked about robotics, a lot of really interesting research working, uh, working on our gut, you know, microbes, both for humans, but also for, for animals as well. And of course, yeah, productivity, we want to get more meat from each animal. But let's not forget about quality, right? We don't want to just put out a bunch of pounds that people don't want to eat. So, you know, we got to think about ways we also make that pork uh, tastier, more flavorful, uh, how it's packaged, how it's used, make it more convenient for consumers, too. I think all that innovation is certainly out there. So, uh, you know, as we talk about innovation, one of the innovations that maybe is happening outside the industry, I'm just going to check the time here, make sure I don't go too long is uh, uh, the emergence of the plant-based meat alternatives. Um, so these are not your you know, grandfather's uh, soy burger. These are you know, newer products, think the Beyond Meat or the Impossible Foods that really do try to mimic the texture and taste of, of meat. Um, what are consumers thinking about these? First of all, I think you know, it is a competitive threat to the industry, but where is it going? And what, you know, what kind of dent might it have on demand for pork? This is a survey that Glenn Tonser and I do every month, partially funded by the National Pork Board, um, on consumer preferences. So we give people a, a question, like the one you see at the top, of if you're shopping for your household uh, and you had to pick one protein for dinner, which one would it be? And there's a set of prices. Uh, 
And what I'm showing you here is just the share of people in each of these months that chose each of these products. So here's pork chop, for example. About 15% of people chose the pork chop out of that set of nine options. But here's your plant-based patty, you know, around 3%. It doesn't really seem to be gaining a lot of extra adherence over time. It looks pretty, pretty stable to me. Um, people might say, well, those are products attempted to, that are attempting to replicate a beef burger in pork were isolated. I'm not sure that's entirely true. So if I just, if I, you know, use some mathematical simulations, I ask the question of that, you know, of that 3% market share, that 3% of people uh, choosing it, what would they have chosen if the plant-based patty didn't, wasn't there? And about 14% of them would have chose the pork chop. So it's, you know, again, uh, you know, 14% of 3% is not a huge number, but it's not nothing. So there's some impact there. Uh, what about price sensitivity? So like uh, Impossible has announced uh, a while back they're going to try to bring down their prices by 20% over the coming months. So you know, our estimates from these data we collect suggest a 10% reduction in a plant-based price would, would reduce bacon and pork by about you know, 1.2 to 1.4%. So there, there is some impact there. But it's way more important what happens to pork prices, right? A 10% reduction in pork prices causes a 30% increase in uh, bacon production and a 24% increase in pork chops. So in other words, back to that productivity story, making sure pork is affordable and competitive is way more important than worrying about uh, what's happening to the prices of the plant-based alternatives, at least at, at the moment. Um, just real briefly, this is a study we did for the beef industry. So sorry, I don't have these questions for pork, but I suspect they'd be similar. And then as we just asked people, which, which of these two products do you think is better for a whole bunch of dimensions in terms of taste, price, uh, convenience, freshness, nutrition, a, a beef burger or a plant-based burger? And you can see that red line is universally higher across the board. Where it gets closer is things not surprisingly on uh, animal welfare and environment. It gets a little more similar. But all this is a way of say, saying that despite a lot of negative publicity, people still have very positive views about, uh, in this case, at least beef production. But I assume we'd, we would find similar results for, uh, for, pork, for pork, um, pork products. But you know, where, where are these products competing? Environment, concerns about environment, and animal welfare. So to the extent those things become more important to consumers in the future, you might expect there to be you know, a bigger shift there. One story you don't see a lot is, you know, about two years ago, you were probably seeing articles that were showing this massive increase in sales growth of these plant-based alternatives. But this, this, these data come from grocery store scanner data. What this is showing you is uh, the change in sales in a given week relative to the same week one year prior. The big uh, blue kind of line that's kind of going up like this, that's uh, turkey and that's Thanksgiving. So in other words, people bought a lot, they spent a lot more on turkeys this Thanksgiving than they did last Thanksgiving, which makes sense because the pandemic was in a slightly better spot uh, this year than it was last year. The thing I want you to pay attention to this black line are the, the meat alternatives. It's negative. So it, it appears for whatever reason that sales growth has actually really leveled off and in fact uh, has fallen a bit over the course of the last year and a half. I don't know entirely what's going on there. It is a little bit mysterious. I, you know, one of my interpretations is, and this, we can also see this in some of our survey data, is that some of the motivation for trying these products was novelty. People wanted to try something new, test it out, see how it was, and maybe what they're not seeing are perhaps those repeat, repeat purchases. So my take home message with regard to the plant-based protein is uh, you should pay attention to it because it is a competitive threat, but at the moment you don't need to lose sleep over it that it doesn't appear like it's going to take over the world in the near term, but you got to, you know, might be among your set of factors you're, you're keeping in your eye, uh, you know, keep, keep your eye out there. So I think there are a lot of interesting opportunities there. The, you know, the meat case looks different than it did before. You got a bunch of these new plant-based alternatives. It, it could open up some opportunities that weren't there before as people reconsider, like, what is meat? Um, you know, blended products, for example, could, could be an opportunity. Uh, pork and mushroom, pork and something else. Uh, what are the pork options that consumers aren't thinking about they might think of before? I don't know how this industry can, you know, recreate the chicken sandwich wars, but what's the pork product that could do that too? You know, that's, that's the sort of thing I think would be interesting to think about. Um, 
you know, in the long term, to the extent these plant-based products really start to gain some traction, how, how does the pork industry compete? Uh, you know, interestingly, I think the, you know, the ingredient list of uh, one ingredient is, is a pretty powerful uh, argument there, and I think that's one that'll go forward, although you've got to balance that against the fact that we do need to use science and technology, and sometimes some things to improve productivity uh, as well. But I think, you know, taste, not just pro uh, quantity of protein, but what types of protein seems to be a really important issue going forward, where I think traditional meat products compete relatively well against some of these plant-based products. Okay, gonna move on real briefly and kind of wrap up with two uh, quick things. Um, you've probably seen the headlines, you know inflation is out there. I just wanna share a few thoughts about what I think is going on there. So first off, a little uh, you know, plug for some research we have at Purdue. You can go to this uh, address. We've created this little tool where you can you know, pick which food you wanna look at and look at what's happening to those, those prices over time, either compared to last month or compared to last year, or compared to any date in the past you want to pick, um, it'll compare those. So this is the latest data we have on, on price, uh, on inflation and food prices is from December. But as of December, um, total inflation, so food and non-food, was running about 7% on a year-over-year -year basis. That's a number we haven't seen since you know, roughly the 1980s. So that's one of the reasons you're seeing a lot of headlines. And then in particular, food is just lagging that a bit, about 6%. It's running, been running about that for the last several months. And then you can see beef, here's pork, at about 15% higher than it was the previous year. So this is what's been cap capturing all those headlines and you know, probably motivating some of what you've seen in that White House uh, document there too. So what, why are we seeing this? I already alluded to a little bit of it. We have some extra costs from higher feed prices. Um, one of it is, you know, one of those costs, though, in addition to just, you know, on the farm thing is, you know, wage rates. A lot of folks are having a hard time getting labor, and when they can get labor, they have to pay them more to show up. So these are changes in uh, weekly earnings of non-supervisory workers in uh, meatpacking, restaurants, food manufacturing, groceries, relative to the, you know, prior to the pandemic in January 2020. So in meatpacking wages, uh, those total wages are up almost 20% over that two year time period. Um, and pretty much every segment of the food sector, you see you know, much higher wages today. By the way, if you're a worker, if you had a job and you're one of the workers whose wages increased, those wages were more than the increases in the food prices. So you're actually you know, uh, better off. If you, cause you, it, one way to think about it is you can afford more food if your wages have kept up. Now, these increases are higher than the, the wages sort of across the economy as a whole. And it does suggest that the wage pressures in food have been, have been more acute than in other areas of the economy. Um, the other thing, though, is just sort of macroeconomics. We dumped a bunch of money in the economy following the start of the pandemic. Um, you know, it was the stimulus payments, uh, an increase in unemployment benefits. You, many of you probably got you know, those checks in the mail from the government. That's this big spike. This is money supply. So that's the classic definition of inflation is more dollars chasing the same amount of goods. So uh, you know, it just means the value of any dollar is lower than it was before if there are more dollars floating around and the way that gets manifested is in higher prices. Uh, you can also see it in savings rates. So um, this is the, the percent of, of income that consumers are saving. You saw a big spike, this goes back to 2000. Uh, that consumers were saving a lot of that money. Interestingly, we've come back down to a more sort of a, a number more in line with what we're accustomed to seeing. So maybe this is some evidence, at least on the consumer demand side, that perhaps that might start to tail off a little bit there. This is a, the market's expectation of inflation. One way you could do this is you look at what the bonds that are uh, treasury, infl uh, uh, treasury uh, inflation protected treasury bonds compare that price to bonds that are not inflation protected. And that gives you an estimate of sort of what the market thinks is gonna to happen to inflation. So you can see there's a big increase, but it's sort of leveled off and it's not, not skyrocketing just yet there. So where's it going? Everybody wants to know, is this uh, um, inflation transitory or is it gonna go back to normal? And my answer is it's always transitory. We just don't know how long the transition is, right? Is it gonna be in two months? or two years, or two decades, I don't, you know, I, I don't know. If I could answer that question, I would, I would not be an academic economist. I would be on Wall Street somewhere. Um, 
but I think it's likely to stick around with us for the next couple of months, um, if, not, if not longer. I'm going to wrap up by you know, just mentioning a th few things around uh, politics of meat consumption and, and uh, you know, mention something about Prop 2. I think I showed you the slide on the demand story, which is really positive. And I think it's, it's remarkable in light of a lot of the negative publicity that's hit the industry over the last uh, several years. So uh, dietary guidelines reports, we have the Eat Lancet report, that little slice there is like how much uh, meat they say you should have on your plate. Um, other you know, issues like the World Health Organization making pronouncements about red meat and processed meat. Um, you, know, you, you would think in a lot of ways that we would have seen a really strong impact on demand. And, and as I've already shown you, we haven't seen it yet. Maybe another way though to think about it is demand could have been even stronger had these things not, not happened. Um, and so these are, you know, these are debates I've been involved in a lot. There's me on, you know, talking to John Stossel. Are, are cheeseburgers killing the planet? Um, oh, that's with Stuart Varney. Uh, of course, you know, everybody wanted to talk about the meat packing pl sh plant shutdowns on, on CNN and, and ABC and so forth. But um, I got a picture of Beyonce here, and that's because when I was going on John Stossel's show back when he had a show on Fox, uh, he was talking about Beyonce because Beyonce is a vegetarian. So he's doing this little segment about her. And um, as, you know, as, as you maybe want to do, if you're going to be on TV, sometimes I record myself so I can see myself when I get back home and how I did. And so I was, uh, I was playing back this show, and I just happened to hit pause on my recorder as they were shifting between the segment on Beyonce to the segment with me. And for this little moment in time, Beyonce's picture was on one side of the screen, and my face was on the other side of the screen. And I like to refer to this as a time I appeared on TV with Beyonce. So <laughs> pinnacle of my career, it's all, all downhill since then. Uh, the point is, you know, these issues about you know, meat consumption, what's it doing to health and the environment, you know, they're you know, mainstream discussions. You know, the stuff about um, you know, what was happening to meat prices have, uh, you know, it was on every major media outlet over the last few months. Um, and I think what impact is that going to have? And a couple of thoughts there is, uh, despite overall demand strength, one question is, you know, are more people becoming vegetarians or vegans or flexitarians? Our data seems to suggest, yes, there's a very slight uptick in the number of people on a survey, at least, that tell you they're a vegetarian or a vegan over time. Who are those people? Um, the biggest predictors of somebody saying, yes, I'm a vegetarian, is if you're a young, liberal, female. Um, those are the strongest predictors. Uh, and I mentioned that liberal one to say, that, that suggests to you that politics get wrapped up in these discussions, too. Uh, other, you know, contributors that are not quite as determinative as those top three, but do, do, we do see some correlations with um, Western US versus particularly the Midwest. Um, income and, and uh, you know, non-white uh, people tend to have a slightly higher rates of, of vegetarianism. Um, the other thing we can see, some interesting analysis, I, I want to update this because I haven't uh, looked at this in a while, but is we basically have a measure of meat demand, and I just split that measure of meat demand between conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats. Maybe not surprisingly, um, across the board, the conservative Republicans, their demand for meat was higher than the liberal Democrats. But the interesting thing is that gap has widened over time. In other words, meat consumption is becoming a more politically polarizing issue. Uh, maybe not surprising because you think about issues like climate change that, that have been linked to you know, meat consumption and demand. Climate change is not a politically polarizing issue, is it? Of course it is. So those things are, seem to be bleeding over into meat consumption. The other thing we see is that this gap, it really is graded by income, or not income, by education. So if you have you know, low, low educated uh, consumers, basically there's no difference between the two. It's only the really highly educated consumers where you get this partisan gap between those. And one way to think about that is the smarter you are, the easier it is to fool yourself. In other words, it's easier for you to find information that supports your priors. It's also easier for you to know what does my peer set think about what I should think on these issues. Um, I think the unfortunate part of this graph is that it suggests that conversations around meat are going to be more challenging in the future uh, when we talk about them. Um, I'm going to come back to that slide. So um, it can't just be what does the science say on this issue, 
It's got to be who is communicating the science. That's going to matter more. Are they a part of my tribe, the people that I look for for information? Um, and people are going to interpret these things through their, their partisan lens. So I think that this uh, you know, polarization of meat consumption, I think, is one that's going to make conversations particularly difficult. Uh, Prop 12, I know there was a session yesterday, so I'm not going to say a lot about it other than still a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen there. I think we're still wait California still has not developed an actual standard for how they're going to implement this, so they seem not to be enforcing the, the rule at the moment, and, th and there's still some um, legal issues that are pending. But just you know, to emphasize some analysis that, that I did recently with Glenn Tonser, um, we uh, estimated demand for different pork products in 51 major markets around the United States. And then we took those estimates and you know, we can do some calculations, like what happens if California essentially, you could think about as imposing a tax um, on pork products. You can see a really big impact in California. So these are quantity reductions in these different pork products in San Francisco, San Diego, Los Angeles. So a 10% tax would have you know, big impacts in, you know, different across different markets and also different across different pork products. But I think perhaps the more important thing is, well, California can do whatever it wants to do, but it, it has impacts outside of California. So, you know, our estimates, or my estimate, I should say, is, you know, it might have, you know, it'll likely cause a reduction in U.S. pork prices across the board, about 2%, and in the long run, reduce pork production by about half a percent. So, you know, that, you know, you reduce price, you reduce quantity, that reduces revenue um, to the pork sector over the long term. Uh, interestingly, though, you know, consumers in other parts of the world, I'll just put Chicago here as an example, might consume a little bit more pork. Why? Because California is not going to be consuming as much. And if other folks don't comply, there's more pork sitting around in Chicago than would have been there before. So they might actually consume a little more. So just to, you know, wrap up, though, I think um, I heard that y'all had some, you know, uh, visitors here in some of your sessions earlier from some, uh, you know, protesters. I think that that's not going to go away. Um, I think that criticism of, of agriculture is probably here to stay. But I think we got to think about how to engage productively in those conversations. It might not be always with the the people that are protesting, but who who has an open mind and is willing to engage on these conversations. But you got to think about it carefully. I think in light of some of the politics that get surrounded, these things that communication is going to be interpreted through a political lens, and it matters probably as much who is communicating than what is being, being communicated. So uh, I think those are opportunities for us to get engaged and communicate these. I think the good news is uh, this industry uh, has some really positive stories to tell. I talked about the productivity story and the sustainability story. I think that's an incredibly positive story, and I think a lot of the innovations that are happening in this, in this space are ones where we're going to have a bright future ahead, but we've got to think carefully and strategically about how we talk about those with the general public. So I know I've thrown a lot at you, but it's been my pleasure to be here, and uh, I better stop. And I, th I think we have some time for a few questions if somebody has one. What? I think you got one over here. <laughs> Thanks for your presentation. Um, so. Uh, a few slides back, you had a um, you you brought up the alternative proteins. Mm -hmm. um, so, as an economist, have you had a chance to study the relative sustainability of uh, well, there, I, I lump it into two categories, right? The plant-based proteins and then the lab-based proteins. Um, you know, have you had a chance as an economist to study where you think they? Uh, their, their trends would lead them to be in terms of sustainability, and again, sustainable both on a uh, relative cost uh, as well as a relative carbon footprint, for example. Yeah. So, unfortunately, most of the claims that exist out there in terms of you know less land use or water use or climate emissions all come from the companies themselves. So, there's not a lot of peer-reviewed. Uh, type of literature on that. You did mention the way I think about it as an economist, uh, and that is the prices have to reflect resource use over time. And for most of these plant-based products, they are selling at a premium to even beef products, which suggests they're using more resources. So now maybe it's that they're still in a startup phase. They need a big, big they need a big build, build bigger facilities and get those economies to scale, and they'll eventually bring those costs down.
Um, but the way I think about it is if we don't wake up five or 10 years from now and their, those products not be substantially less expensive, then we really have to question the claims that they're using a lot fewer resources. Um, so that's sort of the economic standpoint uh, way I think about it. In terms of all the other things, I, I don't know this other way. I just will point out, I noticed uh, in Europe, this announcement just came out yesterday. This is with the uh, plant-based dairy alternatives that one of the governing bodies there forced uh, one of the companies to remove a bunch of its claims about carbon emissions um, and, uh, and land use uh, because they couldn't be substantiated uh, by, by the science. So I don't know, you know whether that's broadly true or not. Uh, Oatly was the one that you know, kind of captured that uh, attention. It was in the UK. So I don't know. I think it's, a, it's an open area for, for research to be done for sure. And look, it's very, it's very possible and even likely that, that uh, a lot of these plant-based alternatives will use less land uh, and perhaps have lower climate emissions. I mean, I think that seems very, that's a reasonable thing to assume. It's really kind of about feed conversion, right? If you, if you feed the calories straight to us humans rather than, than through an animal, that makes some sense to me. Um, but that's not, that's not the only reason we, we consume things. We consume things because for other reasons, like we like the taste of it. <laughs> and um, that's a perfectly legitimate reason to consume something, even if it has a slightly you know, higher carbon emission or slightly more land use. We, want to pay, we have to pay for that in the higher prices. But um, you know, I think uh, I have a much more nuanced view on people you know, talk about, say, clim uh, like carbon taxes, for example. I think most people think, well, if it's bad, if it produces carbon and we tax it, you, nobody will consume it anymore. But that's actually not right. Like, actually, if you think about in beef, which is the one that has, it, which is the protein that has probably the biggest carbon imp impact, if you calculate the social cost of carbon and you put a tax on beef, it would be like maybe 25 cents a pound more expensive. So the, the question you should ask yourself is, how much less beef would I eat if it was 25 cents more per pound? You still eat a whole heck of a lot of beef, probably, right? Um, and so I think, you know, that, well, anyway, I'll just, I think I've said what I wanted to say on there without going on another uh, soapbox. Any other questions for Dr. Lusk? Hey, Jamie? Yeah. I, I think you can hear me. I'm curious when you talk about concentration, take a look at the history of retail price spread. What's happened to the producer's yeah. share? What's happened in, in processing has been about stable. Mm -hmm. The growth has come at the retail level, mm -hmm. the retail wholesale. Yeah. Other than Senator Klobuchar asking in a in a hearing one day, is anybody looking at the <laughs> retail side of this thing, consolidation? Yeah. So, so you. You are right. If you look at just those, you know, marketing margins, the price price spread between, say, price of a hog on a farm versus the wholesale price of meat versus that retail price we pay as consumers, the the where most of the change has happened has been on the retail level. You're you're right about that. Um, I have a couple of thoughts about that. One is uh, those price differences are not always a good, can be, but are not always a good reflection of, say, market power. Because they've, they've got to reflect costs, too. And so if we think about um, you know, a lot of the food products we buy today, uh, they look a lot different than they did 20, 30 years ago. There's more packaging, more processing, uh, more transportation. And so that, that, you know, those costs have to drive some of those wedges, too. Um, I also think. Uh, you know, speaking of food retailers, that's a pretty low margin business too. Uh, if you look at sort of financial statements of some of the big retailers, you know, they're like a 2%, um, mm -hmm. you know, kind of margin business. So this is, this, these are not extraordinarily profitable. Doesn't mean they don't necessarily have some market power. Uh, my colleague who I mentioned earlier that we're working on a paper together, uh, she, she has a separate paper where she looked at this issue of market power. Is the market power between the packer and the farmer or between the packer and the retailer? She finds much stronger evidence, evidence of it between the retailer and the packer than between the packer and the farmer. Um, so I don't know. I think it's a good question to ask. I think it's a question to do some research about. I, I, do, say, I do think these price spreads are not the best evidence of whether there's sort of market power or manipulation there, but I think it's a legitimate question to ask. And is it just cost? You know, are there are those added? Is it you know, is it more than just added costs that we've we've uh, picked up at the retail sector? 
uh, or is there something else going on there? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. There hasn't, there's, there hasn't been good research on that. So I think, it, I think, it's an, uh, I think one of the things we'll, we'll probably start to see actually because of what, what we're living through over the past couple of years is we're likely to see a lot more academic research in the next three to four years on these topics. And I think that's a good thing um, because a lot, to be frank, a lot of the research that I'm using to inform my views about the industry is about 10 or 15 years old. So it's probably good that we're, we're taking another look at some of these issues and seeing if, if the, the views that we formed based on the research, you know, 15, 10, 15 years ago is still true today. I think, you know, I think that's important for us to do from time to time.